Okay, uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today we're going to finish up uh, talking about the various research articles and things that I've posted, um, including a little bit about a series of research articles <coughs> that, uh, that came out um, originally in 2011 and then uh, in 2012 got a lot of uh, pushback against them about RNA editing. <coughs> um, and so, uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about those today, um, and then depending on time, maybe get a bit of a brief introduction into um, into some of the stuff involving the immune system that relates to Group Three's paper, which of course we're going to be talking about uh, tomorrow afternoon over in Mellon Institute, um, and uh, and so and there's a short pre-assignment that's up on Canvas and everything for that. Um, so uh, just to kind of um, remind you where we were, sort of uh, what, what we were talking about at the end of class last time about RNA editing. Um, in eukaryotes, it's been well documented that RNA editing happens and that the type of RNA editing that happens that's been very well documented in eukaryotes is RNA ed editing by deamination, um, which is um, taking an amine and removing it and replacing it with what's called a carbonyl or a double bonded oxygen, um, and that converts um, uh, a C base into a uracil base. Um, that's the exact same uracil as every other uracil. Um, and uh, and um, the difference between uracil and thymine, if you remember, because thymine, the T is what's in DNA, is there's an extra methyl group on thymine. Um, and um, it's thought that the reason why DNA uses thymine, whereas RNA uses uracil, is that, um, uh, in, uh, is that this reaction can happen uh, spontaneously. It has a pretty slow rate. It doesn't happen very often. Um, but, um, but it can happen, and when it does happen in the nucleus to your DNA, um, you don't want that to be a permanent change in the genetic code. Um, and, so, uh, and so because thymine has an extra methyl group on it, um, enzymes in the nucleus can detect whether something is an inappropriate uracil or a proper thymine that's supposed to be in there um, and figure out uh, if there has been a mutation that has occurred. And then, um, and then there are enzymes that will remove the uracil and convert it back and put back in uh, a, 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 um, a cytosine base. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's... Um, but, uh, but if it happens to an RNA molecule spontaneously, then that RNA molecule is probably just going to make a junk protein that doesn't fold properly and doesn't do anything, which is pretty much okay. Um, it's, it's a little bit of lost energy, but not a lot. Um, but sometimes uh, cells will intentionally edit their RNA, um, and they have accessory proteins um, that bind to certain sequences near a site that's supposed to be deaminated um, and intentionally convert a CAA into a UAA or a, uh, you know, an ACA into an AUA or whatever it wants to do, converting a C to a U. Um, and these conversions, um, the most well-documented versions of these are converting CAAs into UAAs or CAGs into UAGs, um, which introduce a premature stop codon or, I guess, an early stop codon. <coughs> um, and when a cell is doing this on purpose, it does this to create a truncated version of a protein. And some, in some cases, that truncated version still has a function, but it'll function differently from the full-length version. Um, and, so, uh, uh, and so that's why um, uh, metabolism of lipids um, uh, happens differently in intestinal cells versus liver cells. Um, and it's yet another way on top of um, alternative splicing of RNA that cells can make multiple different RNA, or multiple different proteins, rather, off of the same gene. Yeah, so any questions about that type of RNA editing, first of all? There. Um, there's also um, an enzyme uh, um, uh, called adenine, uh, uh, deaminase, uh, uh, um, adenine deaminase enzyme, um, and that adenine deaminase will convert an A into, a, uh, into an inosine. 
uh, uh, which is um, chemically very similar to um, a, a guanosine or guanine nucleotide. Um, uh, when it's um, without the phosphates, we call it guan uh, guanosine. When it's with the phosphates, we call it guanine, which is silly in my opinion, but that's the way life goes. Um, but in any case, um, uh, we convert adenosine to inosine, um, which is similar to, to guanine or guanosine. Um, uh, but, um, and, and this reaction, too, could happen in your DNA. But because these are different from each other, there's an extra um, uh, amine group on the G. Um, similarly, enzymes in your nucleus can tell when this happened in your DNA and repair it. Um, but in terms of RNA, Inosine is a little bit iffy. It sometimes does some funky wobble base pairing, which is something that we talked a little bit about, but um, isn't what wasn't on the first test. Isn't isn't on um, uh, isn't isn't anything that, that we focused a lot of attention on. Um, but basically, you can just think of inosine as being read as identical to a G. It will bind. It will hydrogen bond to um, to a cytosine nucleotide um, and uh, and be read just like a G would be read. Um, and unlike the C to U, which usually just is done to introduce the stop codon, um, the A to I conversion um, can uh, change, can, can introduce a number of different changes, um, uh, sometimes converting um, a hydrophobic like a tyrosine um, into, a hydro, into a polar like a cysteine, um, or converting um, a polar like threonine into a nonpolar like alanine. Um, you can look through the genetic code and see, uh, you know, anywhere we convert an A to a G, what would that be read as? Um, and, uh, and actually, we can even remove a stop codon and convert it to a tryptophan, um, although those uh, uh, usually then there's going to be another stop codon, just a few, uh, few more um, amino acids down. So it won't make a, a significantly larger protein, but maybe it'll make a slightly larger protein. Um, but it can change the, the overall, uh, it can change one, um, one amino acid in a protein, and that can change the protein's function. Um, yeah, so questions about that, first of all, the A to I editing. <clears throat> okay, so um, what we didn't get into last time is, um, so this, this paper that's posted up on Canvas um, is about um, fruit flies, Drosophila nervous system, the adult nervous system of fruit flies, um, and the role that A to I editing has in, um, in uh, the function of the fruit fly nervous system. And in order to test this, what they did is they created fruit flies that lack the adenosine um, uh, uh, um, uh, deaminase uh, enzyme. And so these fruit flies cannot do this deamination reaction. They can't convert A's to I's. Um, and so they wanted to see what happens when, uh, to these flies when they do that. Um, and going into this, they already knew about a couple places where RNA editing happened in the fruit fly. Um, and in order to sort of appreciate that, um, we're going to just kind of give a very brief introduction to how neurons communicate with each other. Um, so, at, uh, so if you have a, a sort of zoomed out version of a neuron, here's the cell body with the nucleus, um, and then there are some short little protrusions of the cell body that are called dendrites, um, and these dendrites are input structures. And then one longer protrusion of the cell body that might have a few branches to it. Um, and these branches all end. So this longer protrusion is called the axon. And then these branches all end in what is called a presynaptic terminal. And then these presynaptic terminals will connect up with the dendrites of another neuron. So here's another neuron with its cell body over here. 
Um, and so the axon is the output structure. And so if we zoom in on one of these um, bulbous presynaptic nerve endings, presynaptic terminals, um, so, so and actually, so then you'll see there's, um, here's going to be our dendrite. This space here is called the synapse. And so before the synapse is our presynaptic terminal. Um, and so that says in the flow of information is coming from this cell down its axon out um, to the next cell where it's then going to receive the signal. And so we call, even though this is the, 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 the end of this first cell, um, we say presynaptic because it comes before the synapse, which is just the space between the cells. So before the space, and then over here, this is the dendrite of the cell that's going to receive. Um, so we call it the post synaptic membrane, or the postsynaptic cell. So the presynaptic terminal of the sending cell, the cell that's sending out a, commu uh, 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 um, a communication. <clears throat> um, or alternatively, we call it the axon terminal because it's the end of the axon, but that's it's synonymous with the presynaptic terminal. Um, and so the way that neurons communicate um, can get fairly complicated, but the, to a first approximation, a neuron at any moment of time is either on or off, and there's a spark or a little um, electrical event called an action potential that occurs in the neuron and travels down the axon um, and reaches the presynaptic terminal. So we have this little electrical spark that travels down to the ends of the axon. Um, and then what's going to happen is we're go when that action potential, that electrical spark, reaches the axon, the goal, so this, this axon is filled with vesicles, which are spheres, small spheres of membrane, um, the same kind of lipid bilayer membrane that makes up the membrane of the cell here. Um, we have these spheres of, of, uh, of membrane, and inside the spheres of membrane, um, there are about 20,000 molecules in each sphere of a chemical called a neurotransmitter. This could be serotonin or dopamine or glutamate, which is an amino acid, also functions as a neurotransmitter, um, and a variety of other things. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, endorphins um, are actually small proteins that function as neurotransmitters. Um, and so, yeah, so there's all these different neurotransmitters there. And so this electrical event travels down the axon, reaches the axon terminal, and then what's going to happen is one of these vesicles is going to fuse its membrane with the cell membrane, and then all of the chemical that's inside diffuses out into the synaptic space. And then over on the other side, at the receiving end, um, some of this neurotransmitter is going to stick to one of these um, what are called neurotransmitter receptors. Um, another term for these that you see in cell biology is ligand-gated ion channels. Um, they can also be G-protein coupled receptors, and the neuroscientists have another name for those. Um, but uh, they can be either G-protein coupled receptors or ligand-gated ion channels. And then this is going to open up a little hole down the middle of this. So the neurotransmitter binds, opens up a little hole, and allows, for example, some sodium ions to flow in. And that will change then, uh, that leads to a change in voltage on this receiving cell, <clears throat> which then is going to affect whether or not it becomes active. Um, yeah. or, or we might let in some calcium, and calcium, might, calcium would change the voltage. Um, so calcium is going to lead to a change in voltage. And also binds to some proteins. Um, and then depending on what those proteins are, uh, it does um, 
does something else to the cell. It can be activate various biochemical pathways, turn on the transcription of genes, turn off the transcription of genes, any number of things um, that calcium can do once it comes into the cell. Okay, so that was like basically a week's worth of what you might get in cellular neuroscience um, thrown at you in about 10 minutes. So uh, actually, yeah, we're not even quite done with it, but let me pause there. So we've got this, so the sort of overview is we've got this um, electrical event in the presynaptic cell that causes a, a release of a chemical signal that goes into the space between the cells, binds to a receptor, and causes ions to flow across the receptor into the receiving cell, which changes the voltage and or the chemistry of what's going on in the receiving cell. Yeah, so, okay, so let's pause there before we go any further on along with this, and uh, what questions do people have about this? Yes? How is um, there are, yeah, um, so there are proteins, as with anything interesting in biology, there's proteins. Um, and the proteins in this case are, um, uh, so this would be what's called the ligand-gated um, ion channel. Um, the ligand is uh, something that sticks to it. Um, and so um, what the, lig the, the, the neurotransmitter, that's our ligand here. And then when the neurotransmitter sticks to this protein on the receiving cell, it opens up a hole that lets sodium through. There are also um, uh, other proteins that are voltage activated as opposed to ligand activated um, ion channels. And so um, when this neuron here or this neuron here or whatever gets, um, gets uh, enough of a change in its voltage, then those start opening and they create a temporary positive feedback system that, um, that uh, allows excess, uh, a bunch of positive ions to come in and creates this electrical signal that propagates. There are these voltage activated channels all across the axon and so there's this wave of electrical signal propagating along the axon by the opening of these channels and allowing uh, uh, positive ions to flow in, which changes the voltage across the membrane. Yeah. There's got to be more questions than that, though. I went over like a ton of stuff in about 10 seconds there. What else? Wei Chung's taking a picture. You can share that with the class of everything. <laughs> yes, anything? Okay, wow. Um, all right. Um, so the main idea, the main point of this is that neurons communicate with each other. And in communicating with each other, um, they can cause changes in one another's um, electric, uh, uh, the, electrical the electrical properties of the neuron um, that's receiving the signal, and also the, um, the, the biology in terms of activating, uh, um, uh, uh, allowing calcium to come in, which can activate various things. Um, calcium also plays an additional role in the presynaptic terminal. So, um, so Brendan asked the question, how, do, um, how does the signal get down? Um, we have these voltage-activated um, sodium ion channels that, that sort of let this wave of opening of, cha of sodium channels. Sodium comes in, and then as sodium comes in, that depolarizes the cell. That, sorry, that's a technical term. As sodium comes in, that makes the inside of the cell more positive. And in making the inside of the cell more positive, that propagates this electrical signal. Um, but sodium uh, doesn't bind very well to very many proteins. It can pass through a hole in a protein into the cell to change the electrical um, voltage across a membrane. But sodium does not bind very well to proteins. Um, and so instead what we have here are um, another class of proteins that are voltage activated calcium channels. Um, and so <coughs> Um, the sort of proper sequence of events would, see, would be that we have a presynaptic cell has this action potential, um, which is an <clears throat> electrical event that um, sort of fills the entire cell. <coughs> 
Um, and then when that action potential reaches the presynaptic terminal, because there's this change in voltage, that will activate these voltage, see they call them voltage gated or voltage activated, voltage gated or voltage activated, um, <coughs> uh, calcium channels. Um, and so then what happens is calcium ions flow into our presynaptic terminal. And then the calcium ions will, so calcium, there are some proteins that stick very well to calcium. Um, sodium, like I said, is from a, is, is somewhat inert. It carries charge and can change the electrical potential, but there's not a lot of proteins that stick to sodium. They, they can pass through a protein, but it doesn't really stick to it. Whereas the calcium, ion, um, calcium ions bind to, um, to um, proteins on these vesicles that are full of neurotransmitter. And then the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse, into that synaptic space. Um, and then once the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic space, then it will bind to the, um, to the uh, um, receptor proteins on the postsynaptic cell, on the receiving cell. And then it might let in just sodium, and that will make the cell a little bit more positive on the inside. Um, it might let in sodium and calcium, and if it lets in sodium and calcium, it makes the cell more positive on the inside and might change some other biochemistry by activating various other proteins, and there are dozens of different proteins that are sensitive to calcium that can be activated in that receiving cell. Um, and there's actually a, a link here to a longer description that sort of draws out a lot of these steps uh, here um, uh, on the, from the, from the um, PowerPoint slide. Um, so if you want to sort of like step back through it and see all the steps, you can, you can go back to that as well. Um, yeah, but again, this is like, like I said, like two weeks worth of material thrown at you in about 20 minutes now. So what questions do people have about this? Actually, let's, let's um, uh, do this. Let's, let's sort of um, take five minutes and get together with your group, um, discuss uh, sort of all of these different steps, and especially the role of calcium on both sides of the synapse, the role of calcium on the presynaptic terminal and the role of calcium on the, on the receiving cell on the postsynaptic terminal. Um, but also sort of summarize all of this and then write down any questions that your group as a whole is still confused about. Um, and then we'll come, well, let's take, let's take like six or seven minutes to do that and then we'll come back together and, and discuss all of this as a group before we move on into like why this, how this relates to RNA editing. Yeah, so go ahead and get in your groups and, 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 uh, and start discussing that. <laughs> if, if nobody has any, if we start, start by thinking about the, the different jobs calcium does on both sides of the synapse and make sure everyone's clear on that, um, if, nothing, if nothing else. What's that? Falling behind? Well, that's why you're in review, then, then talk about it. <laughs> if you're not going to ask me questions, then you can ask each other questions. <laughs> Uh, 
Changes that that voltage change sort of propagates through the whole cell and fills the whole cell with this changing voltage, so the and then oh 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 in the postsynaptic cell. Um, well, yeah. So that's a matter of um, let's, let's add, ask that and we get back to the whole group. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what, what is what is the substance in the static flips? The substance <laughs> well, this, it's just water. It's just, yeah, well, mostly. And until the neurotransmitter comes in, and then the neurotransmitter fills this. Yeah, yeah, I, I call it the synapse. They call it the synaptic cleft. It's just space. Water. It's just water. So, so uh, if, the, if the neurotransmitter from the goes through the, cha the channel and then is, and went to the receptor. So uh, is there any way to like, guarantee that this substance do not, do not flee out from the, from the two sides? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's a complicated answer. But um, there are other proteins that make sure that it doesn't spill out. Um, yeah. Um, so what if they that's that's another good question to ask. But yeah, so sorry, what were you gonna say? What if so, they so what what if they split out so the, the whole thing will break like that? Not really. Um so one of the, if, if they spill out then what the, the synaptic space is let's see, it's about one micrometer by one micrometer by twenty nanometers. So that's a pretty small volume. Um, it's this little, uh, it's this basically, yeah, you can, you can think of it as like maybe a one micrometer diameter circle that's then 20 nanometers tall. So it's a very squat, flat cylinder with a pretty small volume. Um, but once this, so, so inside that small volume, there's a high concentration of neurotransmitter. But once the neurotransmitter diffuses out, it, it, there's a much more space outside than inside. So, so it's going to go to a, it's going to drop to a very low concentration once it gets out of the synaptic space. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Um. Yeah, there's all sort of like an extracellular cerebrospinal fluid, extracellular fluid that that all that's sort of. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all continuous in your brain. The, 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 the
Well, it, yeah, the, the concentration change just happens locally there, um, mostly, and then it diffuses out, but it, it's going to reach an extremely low concentration once it leaves that small physical space. Um, okay, so it's been, it's been about six minutes, maybe, maybe about two more minutes to finish up your discussions, and then there are a couple questions that people have asked that we'll talk about, and more questions that we'll have time to discuss as well. Yes? Okay, groups of quite Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, so somebody just asked, uh, uh, is this happening all the time? And the answer is yes. Actually, in your brain, you have roughly 100 billion neurons, 88 billion neurons, um, which is comparable to um, within a factor of three or four, depending on who you ask in terms of astronomers, um, the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, uh, and each one of those neurons, on average, has 1,000 inputs and 1,000 outputs. There are some that have as few as two or three inputs, um, and, uh, and some that have as few as one output, um, some that have as many as uh, 100,000 inputs, and 10 or 100,000 outputs. Um, and so um, altogether, that means there's roughly 100 trillion little connections like this in your brain. Um, and this is like the bare bones of what goes on at those connections. Um, uh, so yeah, every so. Every sound you hear, every thought you have involves hundreds and hundreds of synapses. Um, every spot of light you detect, every letter you detect is, is thousands of synapses to process a single letter. Um, and so all of this is going on all the time. This is how your brain functions and how your neurons communicate with each other. Um, and there are classes in neurobiology that you can take if you want to sort of go deeper into that. Um, but there were a few questions... Um, as well, people asked about, so what happened, so after the, after the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse, this synapse, you can sort of think of it as, as, as roughly a cylinder. Um, so the, the presynaptic term, if we sort of turned it up on its end and looked at it from underneath, it would be a circle that's about a micrometer in diameter. Um, so, um, so, that, that's, so, so this is a one micrometer here, and it's sort of you know, rotate around, that's, that's the circle. Um, and so then the, the synapse itself, so this is, a, this is um, roughly a rectangle um, with one micrometer this way, a knot drawn to scale about 20 nanometers this way, so it's pretty short distance. Um, and rotate that around, you get a cylinder that is, um, that's one micrometer in diameter and about 20 nanometers tall, which is a pretty small volume. Um, all of the extra, all, and that's part, and then out here, once you get out of the synapse, this is all extracellular fluid in your brain. Um, and there's, um, oh, I don't even, uh, uh, maybe a quarter of a liter or something of extracellular fluid in your brain. So locally, when, this, when neurotransmitters release, there's a really high concentration here. But once it gets out, then it's going to diffuse away um, and, uh, and, um, and, re and go to such a low concentration that it doesn't have much of an effect once it gets out. Um, but before it leaves, and this is, this is beyond what you need to know, but it's um, uh, kind of interesting um, uh, uh, sort of uh, like, uh, like brain pharmacology. Um, typically, rather than diffusing out, what's going to happen is the presynaptic neuron will suck back in through proteins that are not shown here called neurotransmitter reuptake proteins. Um, uh, that will suck, or neurotransmitter transporters that will suck the, um, the, the um, neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic cell to recycle it. Um, and that also serves to shorten the time that the neurotransmitter spins in the synapse. Um, and a lot of drugs, um, I think, yeah, probably there. I, can't, I, I would have to do a, do, a, do a bit of counting to see, but um, most drugs that affect the brain either affect neurotransmitter receptors or affect those proteins that reuptake. Uh, um, and so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac um, or SNRIs that affect serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake, um, uh, um, uh, methylphenidate, Ritalin, um, uh, affects dopamine transport um, and dopamine reuptake, um, as does cocaine, although in different places in the brain, which is why cocaine and uh, Prozac have different effects on the brain. Um, and, uh, and so um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, as the name implies, um, inhibit and slows down the removal of serotonin, which means serotonin stays in the synaptic space a little bit longer, and you get a bit of a longer lasting serotonin signal. Um, how that affects brain chemistry is an entire semester worth of material to work through. Um, 
But uh, yeah, so anyway, um, the, the short sort of version of this is, um, uh, is that life gets pretty complicated pretty quickly um, with all of this. Um, but what you should know, what you should know is basically what's written out here um, so that there's this spark of, of activity, this, this um, voltage change in the presynaptic cell that causes the opening of these voltage-gated calcium channels in the presynaptic terminal. Calcium comes in here, sticks to the vesicles, makes the vesicles bind uh, and release their neurotransmitter out here, which is then going to activate the receiving cells. Um, you had a question also about, um, like, what? What happens when the calcium turns voltage in the post? Yeah. So, um, so in the postsynaptic cell, what's going to happen is um, when positive ions come in, that will make it more likely for that cell to fire its own action potential. And sometimes um, different neurotransmitters will cause negatively charged chloride ions to come in, which make it less likely for that cell to, to fire its own action potentials. And so we call that exciting the cell, getting it closer to firing action potential, or inhibiting the cell and making it harder for it to fire an action potential. And depending on the relative excitation and inhibition that different cells get, determines whether or not they have their own action potential. And which, so, um, I mean, when people uh, do like artificial neural networks, they have continuous activations rather than, than discrete activations, but in the brain it's more, more sort of discrete activation. Um, but in either case, what you've got is you have positively weighted connections that, that, make, it, that make the next cell more active uh, or more likely to become active, and negative weight connections that make it, that inhibit and slow down or stop the activity of the, of the receiving cell. And so um, e each one of your neurons, like I said, has on average 1,000 inputs. And so it's sort of the weighted sum of all 1,000 inputs that determines at any moment in time whether that neuron is going to become active and, and fire its own action potential, um, which might then be interpreted by the rest of the brain, by the connections that it makes, as seeing a spot of light or hearing a particular sound or whatever. Does that kind of help-ish? I mean, the idea is that we're sort of, we've got an electrical signal in our presynaptic cell. The calcium in the presynaptic terminal converts that to a chemical signal that gets released. And then that chemical signal gets converted back into an electrical signal in the next cell, which is either going to make that cell become active or make that cell not become active on the receiving end. Does that kind of help a little bit with that? Um, yeah. Yes, if it's um, if it's positive, if it's if it's positive ions coming in, then that makes the cell active, and if it's negative ions coming in, then that makes the cell less active. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's um, th there's there's more complexity than that, but that's that's I think a good way to sort of think about it in the, as the first approximation, and definitely plenty for what you need to know for this. I mean, the the point of this, so the reason that we're going into this. Is actually does relate to RNA editing, um, which is that it turns out that um, that in the nervous system in particular, for reasons that nobody really has a good understanding of, um, it seems like RNA editing plays a critical role in the function of connections within the brain. And there are two particular points in the brain that we're going to talk about where RNA editing seems to have a big role in the way the brain functions and is able to communicate with, with itself. Able, they, they, the different neurons in the brain are able to communicate with each other. Yeah, what other questions? So I, I was, group, group two here was kind of like right next to me, so I heard all of their, what other questions did the other groups have? Or group one, sorry, group one here. What other questions? You wrote them down on paper. There's got to be something. What did you all come up with in terms of questions? Nothing? Just kind of summarizing the ideas. How about in group three? What did you, are you group four? Group three. Okay. Uh, could you go over one more time what the voltage-gated calcium channel is? Yeah. So, um, so again, when there's an action potential in the presynaptic cell, that's a that's a that's a voltage event. That's a that's an electrical event in the in the presynaptic cell, and that electrical event, um, it's it's it turns out that the voltage-activated the voltage-gated calcium channel is embedded in the membrane, and there are actually charged, there are um, aspartate amino acids 
that are embedded in the membrane, which is actually hard to do because they're, they're charged amino acids embedded in a fatty area. But, um, but uh, with, with some work, the, the neurons are able to get those in there. Um, and so if you have charges inside, the, the membrane actually functions as a capacitor. And so if you have little charges hanging out in the middle of a capacitor, if the voltage difference across that capacitor changes, then that's going to create a different electric field in the capacitor, which will then make those charges move a little bit. Um, and actually, this relates a little bit to, to what the RNA editing does. Um, but so we've got embedded in the lipid bilayer. And so we <clears throat> sort of come back here and kind of zoom in on this spot right here. Um, this is a lipid bilayer with a big protein in the middle of it. And so the lipid bilayer has um, these um, polar heads and nonpolar tails um, that creates um, a barrier um, that, that prevents ions from flowing across the membrane directly. Um, and so embedded in the protein itself are charged amino acid residues. And so when the electrical field changes across this membrane, those are going to move a little bit. And when they move, they open up a hole that spans the length of the protein that then allows calcium ions to flow in. And then the calcium ions come in stick to other proteins on the vesicles here and trigger them to, to get released. Um, and it turns out that the RNA editing that we're going to talk about in a minute changes not these charged residues, not these charged amino acids, but changes other parts of the protein near them, which alters a little bit their position in the capacitive capacitor that is the membrane, and therefore changes a little bit the way they respond to the changing electrical field, um, and therefore alters a little bit um, the way this, this channel opens and closes in response to um, activity in the presynaptic neuron. Yeah, sure. So those channels respond to calcium concentrations in the synaptic flood? Though, no, they are voltage activated, voltage gated. So they respond to the voltage across the membrane. They have those charged amino acid residues embedded in the membrane in the capacitor here. And that's what activates them. And then once they get activated, they get pulled open and then allow calcium to flow through into the presynaptic terminal. Um, and calcium is at, um, one other sort of piece of this is that calcium is at exceptionally low concentrations inside of cells. Um, there's, uh, it's something like uh, 10 to the minus 3 millimolar, so 10 to the minus 6 molar um, concentration of calcium inside, whereas there's 1 millimolar to 2 millimolar calcium outside. So there's about 1,000 times higher concentration of calcium outside than inside. So just by diffusion, essentially, the calcium flows in. Yeah. Sorry, one more. Uh, yeah, sure. As the voltage then propagates down the axon, yeah. uh, is that sodium ions flowing out? Uh, no, the sodium ions actually are also flowing in um, because the the, um, what the the action potential itself is a, is a neuro, all cells I think there's maybe one or two exceptions to this but all cells have a negative charge on the inside relative to outside um, uh, most of the time um, and so and then when an action potential occurs there's positive charge uh, the, the, there's this, this, the, the action potential is caused by positive charges coming in, and then it creates a positive feedback system where more positively charged sodium ions come in. And then there's another system involving potassium ions that we're not going to talk about because we've added enough uh, headaches to your life already um, that, 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 uh, that sort of reverts everything back to rest. So uh, as um, you have all these positive ions flowing into the cell, does that eventually reach the presynaptic but they don't, they, the, so the, the electrical impulse travels down, but the ions actually, an individual ion doesn't travel very far. But the electrical, the, the electrical, um, the electrical change propagates and then, um, and then sort of travels like a wave of electrical change down. Yeah, that, 
if you if you follow some of the videos here, you can see some animations and stuff of that. That that, that goes a little bit beyond the, the scope of what, the the core point here is that when the cell has an action potential, it's going to release this chemical signal, and then this chemical signal is going to be received by the next cell and activate it. Sort of, and calcium in the presynaptic terminal is involved in releasing that signal. Calcium in the postsynaptic terminal sometimes alters the chemistry of the receiving cell. And those are kind of the two points to be sure to remember. Yeah. What, what about group four? What did you all have? Did you all have other questions about any of this? We were just kind of discussing. Just kind of reviewing it. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so, so back to a little back to RNA editing, or at least a little bit closer to RNA editing. Um, so there's this um, in, in fruit flies, the the gene for, I'm going to write it over here so I don't lose everything else over here. So the gene um, for this voltage-gated calcium channel, which is on the presynaptic terminal, is called um, cacophony, which I probably misspelled, um, or just abbreviated CAC, CAC, um, and the reason it's named that is because, um, so if you, if you take a fruit fly and you engineer it to have no presynaptic uh, voltage-gated uh, sorry, voltage-gated calcium channels, then that fruit fly is just going to die. Its nervous system totally doesn't work. The cells can't communicate with each other at all. It's a dead fly. But... Um, there are mutations that subtly alter the function of this presynaptic um, calcium channel and, um, and make it so that coordination between neurons and communication between neurons isn't very effective. And so this has been known for um, at least 30 years now. Um, here's an image just from, a, from a, um, a review article from a few years ago, but um, fruit fly mating behavior has been studied for, for about a century now. Um, uh, so this is a male fruit fly and a female fruit fly, and um, the male fruit fly um, will sort of see the female, look toward her, start like sort of tapping her on the wing, um, and then quote unquote singing to her, which is just like taking one of its wings and beating it at a certain frequency. And that creates um, uh, ultrasonic sound that we can't hear, but that the female fruit fly can hear. Um, and then if she likes the song, then she'll allow him to mate with her. Um, and um, it turns out that if you, um, so there are a variety of different mutations. Um, one thing you can do is um, engineer fruit flies that, have, that don't develop wings properly. That's called wingless mutation. Um, those fruit flies, um, so, so, wild, so wild type normal, so if you have, if you have, if you have uh, um, uh, normal females and normal males, um, how long does it take before they mate? And within, um, within 20 minutes, essentially 100% of pairs of fruit flies, if you put a male and a female together, within 20 minutes, 100% of them have mated. Um, if the male happens to be without wings, then it takes longer before the flies mate, um, and not all of them, even within an hour, do. Um, if, you, if the male flies have wings, but their presynaptic calcium channels aren't working properly, then what that means is they sort of become uncoordinated. They can't move their muscles, their neurons aren't communicating properly with each other, and the neurons aren't communicating properly with the muscles, and so the muscles that control the wing don't make the right sort of sound and the right, the right, um, the right wing song. Um, and so those males also struggle to mate. Um, it turns out that, this, that if they have no wings and they have um, mutations in the cacophony channel, then they also um, struggle for other reasons because they're disoriented. Um, but but it's been, the, this gets its name because the, 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 if, you, if you record the song, the ultrasonic vibrations, um, it doesn't have the same characteristic frequencies that a normal male mates, makes. And that mutant song is less likely to get a female to mate with it. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Okay, so that's sort of background for the paper. In this paper, 
First of all, what they're doing is they're just looking uh, at, um, um, at Drosophila that, um, that lack the um, ADAR, the, the um, uh, adenine uh, deaminase. Um, uh, so A is adenosine, DA is deaminase, and then R is the, the is uh, sort of the enzyme uh, designation. Um, so the Drosophila they they lack this enzyme, um, and um, and what they're showing here first of all is just um, looking at uh, amount of uh, um, amount of transcript that is present. Um, in uh, uh, of uh, uh, in um, in wild type flies as well as flies that are mutated. Um, so these are sort of the control, and this is what's called a quantitative PCR, where you're looking over the course. You sort of stop the PCR at many different set cycles along the way, and you see um, increasing amplification of the Drosophila ADAR um, transcript and then some RP49, which is some standard transcript that, um, that codes for uh, something that we don't really care about, but just should be present in all of the cells. And then there are two different mutations that they introduce into the Drosophila ADAR um, gene, and in both of those mutations, you do not get any Drosophila ADAR pro, uh, transcript, mRNA, getting made. Um, uh, and so, and so you, no matter how many cycles you run your PCR, you can't amplify um, uh, uh, um, uh, RNA that wasn't being made in the first place. Um, <clears throat> then what they look at is, um, is the enzymatic activity of, um, of these. Um, and so uh, here is... Um, so a variety of different proteins um, that should get altered by the deamination. Um, and the thing that they want to draw your attention to, which is a little bit, so there, there are a variety of controls. And then the main point here is that um, when, the Drosoph when the flies have ADAR in them, then this IMP protein gets modified um, to now bind to a particular antibody, um, and that antibody then will detect it. Um, when the flies have a mutation in the ADAR, um, then the IMP protein doesn't. They have a couple different controls here. Um, one that, um, uh, that, that should always be present only in the case where, um, where they have um, no, no mutation at all, um, and then the other in the uh, um, uh, um, and then the other is just sort of like a continuous loading control. Um, so here we have no mutation. Here we have flies that have a mutant ADAR. And here we have flies that had a mutant ADAR, but we put back a normal working copy. And when we put back the normal working copy, this IMP protein starts to get modified. Um, what they then look at um, is, again, so, so now the HF4 are the normal flies, and then the IF1 and IF4 are their two mutant flies, and then this is just a, a molecular weight standard. Um, and they're looking at um, particular changes um, uh, from uh, a glutamine to a serine, in this case. There's a particular change from a glutamine to a serine amino acid in the cacophony protein. So somewhere over here, there's this glutamine amino acid, or sorry, asparagine, asparagine amino acid, glutamine's Q. Um, and in normal flies, what you find is that, um, uh, is that there is a pretty high fraction of, um, at one site, almost all of the glutamine gets converted to serine. Um, these are native gels, meaning that the charge on the, um, uh, they, they haven't denatured the protein, so they run differently based on the charge. And so, um, and so in this case, this is the edited, this site gets heavily edited um, in the wild type flies, but in the flies that lack the ADAR, that site gets not edited at all. And then there's another spot where there's another asparagine um, that, and both of these can get converted to serine. Sorry, I'm kind of going off the edge of the board here a little bit. 
Um, so, um, so this asparagine gets converted at very high frequency. This asparagine is actually somewhat interesting. It only gets converted about half the time into serine here. Um, but again, in the, in the wild type flies, almost all of the, the asparagine gets converted to serine here in the, um, and actually slows the protein down because of the way it folds. Um, in the, and then over here, it speeds the protein up because of the way it folds when this, uh, when this, when this um, uh, spot is edited. Um, but the sort of point is that in the ADAR flies, we have a particular point that gets edited very efficiently and another point that gets edited with sort of medium efficiency. Um, and then in the, um, in the flies that lack the ADAR protein, they, get edited, they don't get edited at all. We're left with just our sort of normal asparagine residue at this site. Let me pause there. What questions do people have about that? Okay, so, so one, of the, and one of the ways that they assay this is actually one of the things that they do is they, they do reverse transcriptase to, to convert the messenger RNA to DNA, and then they do Sanger sequencing on this. And if you remember, this is what the output of Sanger sequencing looks like. Um, you have these various fluorescent probes that sort of make various uh, sort of make, um, humps. So the sequence of DNA is C, T, A, T, T, C, A, something, G. Um, and, um, and the DNA sequence would be C, T, A, T, T, C, A, A, G. Um, and in the, in the flies that lack ADAR, the flies that lack the ability to deaminate the A's, 100% of the mRNA transcript has an A at this spot. And so because 100% of the um, RNA transcript has an A at this spot, we get a clean Sanger sequence of our reverse transcribed mRNA um, with a very obvious A here. If you look, and this might be a little hard because it's hard to see the colors, um, but um, if you look here, what it, the, the, the automated software can't detect what base is here in the normal flies. And the reason that the automated software can't detect what happens here is if you look in, um, there's equal amounts of a green peak and a black peak right here. Um, and so what that means is that going into the PCR reaction, going into the Sanger sequencing reaction, half of our template had an A there and half of our template had a G there. And so a more sophisticated algorithm or just a human being can say, can tell that the reason that this is not able to call this base is because there is, um, is because there's some A signal and some G signal that overlap. And that corresponds to this site here where, like we saw before, 50% of the mRNA gets converted into, um, into uh, uh, it gets gets edited um, where this at this one particular site. Okay, and so the message, the sort of point of all of this, is that first of all, there's there's one site that sort of almost always gets edited. There's another site that gets edited some of the time, and we can actually detect. That there's, if we, so what, with the way these samples are prepared is it's just you take the whole fly, grind it up, and amplify all of the um, cacophony mRNA. And we can detect that there are two different sequences, one that has an A, one that has a G, which is really an I, in it um, at this one site. And so we can infer, therefore, that half of the mRNA got edited in the fly's brain and the other half didn't. Okay, so let me pause there. That's a lot to sort of work through. What questions do people have about that? So it's the lack of presence of the second protein? It's the, yeah, it's the absence of this, this one here. Um, and so in a normal fly, half of its neurons seem to edit and the other half don't. Um, and then in wild, and, and then in mutant flies that don't have the ability to edit, all of them are stuck with the unedited version. 
That is a great question and something that I wish had been followed up on with this. Is, so you could imagine a couple different scenarios, right? We're, this is taking from a whole fly. So the whole fly, we're just getting all of the cacophony in it. Um, it's possible that half of the neurons edit all of the mRNA and the other half of the neurons edit none of the mRNA. Um, it's also possible that all of the neurons edit half of the mRNA, and there's just some inefficiency there. Um, as far as I've been able to tell, nobody knows which of those two is going on on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, whether it's inefficient in the editing of the mRNA, but it happens inefficiently in all neurons, or whether some neurons edit 100% and some neurons edit 0% of the mRNA. Um, that's one big question. Another big question that I don't think has, has really been answered or is, is touched on with this is um, what does this editing do, right? So changing this asparagine residue into a serine residue, what effect does that have on the, on the cacophony protein? Um, uh, is, um, there have been a couple uh, uh, assays that show that it changes a little bit the speed at which it opens, um, but it's very understudied why that makes any difference. Um, in, the, in the neuron's function. Um, one thing that this paper did show is that if you don't let the flies edit their mRNA, then they die um, much more quickly than other flies. So the typical lifespan for an adult fly is about a month. Um, within a couple of weeks, these flies start dying. If you look at their brains, their brains have these giant holes in them. And why the inability to edit the mRNA for this protein causes these holes to develop in the fly's brains is completely unknown as well. Why these neur the neurons are dying because they can't. Actually, another part of this is that it's not just cacophony. There are a couple other genes that get edited as well. Um, uh, but, um, but the inability, and, and so, you know, first of all, we don't know what the, if, whether it's cacophony specific, this death, or whether the, it's because of these other genes or some combination. But in addition to that, we don't know um, why editing mRNA or being unable to edit mRNA is causing neurons to die in the first place. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of unknowns still with this. Um, yeah. Questions about this, though? Okay, so um, one thing that I kind of wanted to return to with this um, is sort of the, like, why does this affect me side of things? Um, I'm not a fly. Um, it turns out that, that, as far as I know, there aren't, there, there aren't documented examples of mRNA editing in humans um, in, the, um, uh, in, in the calcium channel. But... Um, I sort of mentioned before that um, in some cells, the postsynaptic receptor, in some cells, the postsynaptic receptor um, uh, have receptors that only let, uh, some cells only let sodium through, which is just going to be an electrical signal because sodium doesn't interact very much with proteins. Um, and then others let sodium and calcium through, which is a combined electrical signal and chemical signal. Um, and it turns out that um, what determines whether calcium flows in through the postsynaptic receptors is a particular mutation where a glutamine is converted to an arginine. Um, and in some cells, there's 100% efficiency. Actually, for some cells, they express a certain gene. And for whatever reason, we have not evolved. Instead of, instead of just putting a G in the genome for this one gene, we edit every mRNA that comes off of this gene to convert an A to an I. I have no idea why at some point there hasn't just evolved a G there. It seems way more efficient. But 100% of the mRNA from one gene gets edited. Um, and if you, ex if you have that edited version, 
then the receptor is impermeable to calcium and only lets sodium through. Um, whereas in other cells, they express a gene that doesn't get edited, and that gene that doesn't get edited um, is, allows calcium to flow through and therefore creates a, com a combination of an electrical and chemical signal in the receiving cell um, when, when it gets activated by neurotransmitter. Um, and it turns out that this is very critical for your cell's abilities to form memories among a variety of other things, which is like a whole other couple hours worth of conversation. Um, and, so, um, and so your cell's abilities to learn, your, your neurons, your brain's ability to remember things depends on proper RNA editing um, of this one particular gene that in our case gets edited at 100% efficiency. Um, it's kind of interesting as well that, um, you know, like we talked about how way back here, your cell, your, your liver versus your intestine are able to make two different gene, two different proteins off of one gene um, with RNA editing of a C to a U. Um, for the fruit fly, um, they're able to make two different proteins off of one gene with RNA editing of an A to an I. Um, for the, um, and something about this RNA editing seems to be vital for the nervous system function. We're not sure what. Um, but then in humans, um, there's this essential RNA editing step that goes on in all of your neurons that um, want to express a certain type of, uh, of receptor that is not letting calcium come in to the receiving cell. So questions about that? OK. Um, all right, so uh, for the last 15 minutes or so, um, I wanted to, to switch a little bit and, um, and talk about um, this RNA editing uh, controversy that I've alluded to a couple of times. Um, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, in part because I'm out of time, and in part because um, uh, the, it, it ends up being a lot of time trying to understand something that ultimately um, uh, most, most people who work in this field think is wrong. Um, and so, um, and so uh, the, the point of this, the point of doing this is really to sort of emphasize um, the importance of um, thinking carefully about the experiments and the data that you're collecting. But um, in, let me make sure I get the date right, in 2011, there was um, a paper published in Science, which is one of the top two or so journals of, in the world, um, that, uh, that claimed that there is huge widespread RNA editing. That so we, we'd known of sort of individual isolated cases like these these receptors um, that um, that undergo RNA editing um, by deamination or the apolipoprotein B that undergoes RNA editing by deamination. Um, there are actually a number of other um, different types of RNA editing that have been documented in a variety of prokaryotes and plants um, and other organisms, um, but that. Um, as far as we know, as far as we knew before this paper, in animals, the only type of RNA editing was deamination, and that's the only one that we've talked about in this class. There's RNA editing that involves insertion of bases, deletion of bases. Um, uh, at, so after the introns have been spliced out and everything else, um, you can have uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, some yeast and plants and so on do other types of RNA editing that involve insertion and deletion um, and, and, and a variety of other um, uh, uh, methods of sort of changing the mRNA after it's been finished being transcribed and, um, uh, and um, spliced. Um, and so what this paper, prior to this paper, people's estimates were that there were maybe a couple hundred genes in the human genome that ever had any RNA editing going on in them. And the function of them was sort of understood on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the liver and the, the brain examples um, are two that were well documented. Some others we knew it happened. We didn't really know what the function of it was. Um, and so what this paper did is um, they looked and found about uh, uh, um, uh, several thousand places. So what they did is they collected mRNA from human tissues, 
um, variety of human tissues um, uh, um, uh, from, from uh, hospital biopsy samples and other things, um, and did reverse transcriptase to see what the mRNA was, and then compared that to the genome. And, um, and what they um, claimed is that 10% of the mRNA had, um, had a site, at least 10% had places where they had um, uh, uh, RNA edits, where the, DNA, where the RNA sequence differed from the corresponding DNA sequence. Um, and they documented many different types of changes, including insertions and, and removals of bases, which had never been documented before in animals. Um, and, um, and it was surprising to a lot of people when it came out. Um, and there's sort of a lot, a lot in this paper that we're not going to dig into um, as much. Um, but, um, but it's posted on Canvas. And then it turns out that uh, in the year following the publication of that paper, um, four different papers came out um, trying, oh, no, sorry, I, that's, that's the wrong, um, uh, that's the wrong uh, document. Um, uh, four different papers came out, oh, come on, trying to um, point out different reasons why um, this was wrong, um, and, um, and made esti varying estimates um, around roughly that 90% of what this original study's claims of um, edited RNA sites were, um, were mistakes. Um, and in those papers, they point out a variety of sort of suspicious and, and strange aspects of the data. Um, so, for example, um, uh, a lot of the genes, so if you have Um, a lot of the genes where they found the edits was right around the, uh, after an exon. Um, and um, the authors have their own response to this um, that they published, and which is also published up on Canvas if you want to read through like all of the nitty gritty details of it. Um, but a few of the, the authors that, that argued against this pointed out that, um, so, Let's sort of go back here. If we, if we go back and look at um, uh, alternative splicing for a second, um, which is, um, so here. This exon here and this exon here are very similar to each other. Um, and because they serve virtually the same purpose in the protein, um, they have slight differences. And if you thought that your RNA matched this exon here, um, but in reality, the RNA had undergone alternative splicing and it was this RNA, then you would detect some mutations. You would think that there was a mismatch between the RNA and DNA, but really there was a mismatch between what you, the exon you were lining up with and the exon that was really in the mRNA. And so some of the authors um, of, the, of these, of these papers that pointed out, that they, they claimed that the, the, that the original paper was overstated, pointed out that, um, that the RNAs, if you dig in and look at the RNAs that the authors said were alternatively spliced, are RNA, or sorry, the RNAs that were said were edited, are RNAs that we know have alternative splices, and the mutations that they pointed out um, are actually really in the DNA code at the other exon. So what they were really detecting was maybe um, uh, incomplete, um, uh, uh, incomplete or, um, or unexpected changes in splice variants rather than true edits in the mRNA. Does that make sense? So if, the, if, the, if, if you think you're matching to one, uh, to one splice variant, but you really have another, then that's going to give you something that looks like the RNA and DNA aren't lining up very well um, with each other. Um, in addition to that, um, the, um, 
Uh, there are, we talked a little bit about this before, there are um, uh, entire genes in your genome that are duplicated. Um, hemoglobin is one example um, where there's a version of hemoglobin that, um, that we all expressed in our bodies when we were fetuses and newborn babies that is different from the hemoglobin that we all express now as adults. Um, and those, d those hemoglobin genes are similar to each other because they serve a similar purpose, but they carry mutations. Um, there's another example, which is the enzyme amylase that digests starch. Um, different people have different numbers of amylase genes in their genome. Um, and that has some correspondence with whether your ancestors were more likely to live on a starch rich versus a protein rich diet. Um, but um, these genes are similar to each other, but will have individual point mutations in them. And so if you're mapping to, um, uh, so if you're mapped, so one, one paper said, uh, actually a couple papers said that, that what they did is they just mapped to the wrong um, version or the wrong copy of these many of these genes that exist in many copies in the genome. Um, in addition to that, they pooled data for many individuals. And so a lot of people, a lot of the, the complaints were that um, there was sort of genetic variation between individuals. And so, um, you know, if you're pooling data from me and Stephanie and we're looking at mRNA from both of us um, and, um, and you see that there are some, some mRNAs with one nucleotide and some mRNAs with another, um, it could be that, that we're both editing those mRNAs. Um, but perhaps a more reasonable estimate would just be that there's a, there's a single nucleotide difference in our DNA. Um, and since they pooled the mRNA before they uh, uh, matched it back to the genomic DNA, um, they, they could have sort of like seen the, what, what was really variation between individuals got read out as variation between RNAs. Does that make sense? So, um, and so it's almost like a case study in like, um, uh, in like all of the wrong ways to do data collection and data analysis and um, being sloppy about a variety of different possible alternative explanations and in being sloppy about these variety of alternative explanations, um, you then, that then sort of propagates forward as, um, as coming to a very surprising conclusion um, that is, uh, that is one way to explain your data, um, but not considering some sort of simpler explanations um, of what goes on in the data. Um, and there are other issues as well that some of these papers pointed out, um, such as uh, the, uh, that, the, um, that the authors didn't um, uh, pay careful attention to the quality scores. So back when we were talking about um, uh, um, uh, the FASTQ file format, where there's this ASCII um, character that says how confident you are that you've called a particular base correctly. Um, a lot of the quality scores on those bases that they thought were edited were poor. And so, um, and so that's why this sort of sequencing errors pops up here as well. Um, if your sequencing is bad, then the letter, then the data that you get out of it is going to be bad, and that's not, and then it's not true editing. It just means that um, that your sequencing run wasn't very effective, and most people would throw that out rather than say that there's some heterogeneity in the mRNAs there. Um, so these, the the original paper and the response papers are all posted up on Canvas, and you're welcome to read through. There's also a. Uh, um, a, a re-response from, um, from the original uh, ed, ed, authors um, who have refused to retract the paper despite people claiming that they should, they should say that this was probably a mistake. Um, and so it's, it's sort of an interesting scientific drama where uh, most people working in the field think that the authors messed up, but the authors sort of refuse to, to, to acknowledge that that's a possibility and think that they're sort of, that they were right, even though most people think that they probably messed up. Um, so anyway, it's an interesting sort of bit of science drama um, that you can dig into a little bit more in detail. Um, but the main point um, for this is, I mean, so RNA editing is real. There are well-documented versions of it, um, but, but uh, also sort of to, to be aware of the limitations of data collection. It's sort of an interesting thing to track and follow. Um, okay, any last questions about any of this? This has sort of been a, quite a lot of new material in this lecture. Okay, um, so, so we're going to next, on, on Wednesday, we'll be talking in groups.
about um, the, the, the T cell paper. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then on Thursday, you'll hear more sort of general background about that um, from Stephanie. So, yeah, but I will see you all tomorrow afternoon.